So, uh, day job uh, is as uh, director of the Core Cities Group, uh, 10 big cities across the UK, focused on place based policy, devolution, really leading the way in, in challenging successive governments. Uh, I'm not here to talk about any of that, however. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, a, a sort of more private uh, passion and a book um, that I just published uh, called Psychology in the City uh, with a friend of mine, Charles Landry. And it brings together two lifelong interests, really. In, early on in my career, I worked in psychiatry, very interested in psychology, and then went into working in urban policy. And cities are absolutely, uh, endlessly fascinating. And I think we've had uh, two absolutely superb presentations on that, I have to say. I thought they were really, really brilliant. And picked up a lot of the issues that I was um, uh, going to raise. So it saved us a lot of time, in fact. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say that this book is available in all good stores uh, across the country. Uh, instead, I can say that it is on Amazon, and it is also on a table uh, out the front. So, and there's a little sign on the table which says that they're at half price. Uh, on that sign, there are two email addresses. One, you can log on to PayPal with. The other, you can email me at my personal address. It's clear which they are. So I'm going to say to you, if you're interested in this, take a book and I'm going to trust you to get in touch and uh, either pay on, on PayPal uh, or contact me direct if you feel it is worth the princely sum of five pounds. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a psychological experiment actually. <laughs> how, how well do we trust our urban designers? Uh, feedback at the next conference. Um, so I also I worked for CABE uh, in the past, so urban design something very close to my heart, and it's very good to be talking to urban designers again. I'm going to take just three of the, the topics that we looked at in the book, uh, but first of all, just reflect on some of the things, I think that the points that Rhiannon uh, made particularly around, around happiness and well-being are absolutely critical points, and there's a massive kind of cultural pressure on us to be happy in our uh, relationships and our working life to have perfect holidays that are so stressful you're just glad to get back into the office at the end of them and uh, frankly in a consumer age I think happiness is conflated uh, with fulfillment and it's often about uh, acquisition about consumption or even a kind of state of chemically induced contentment that some of us may be enjoying on a Friday evening as you have your uh, urban design uh, dinner, and uh, I was just struck when Ryan was speaking that about um, a psychologist called Roy Baumeister, whose research absolutely backed up those points and said that you know ha meaning or meaningfulness always trumps happiness, um, and that he said happiness without meaning characterises a relatively shallow, self-absorbed, even selfish life that where things go well, desires are satisfied and difficult entanglements avoided. And that, to me, does not suggest a mature person or a resilient person, or indeed place, if we think about places in that respect. And one of the themes of the book is transferring the ideas and the tools of psychology, uh, which are largely about person, to place, and how, how we can do that, uh, in order to develop what we've described in the book as psychologically resilient uh, cities that enable their residents to achieve the same thing. So I think it's a really good objective for urban design uh, to have in mind, to think about creating places with a sense of purpose, and that purpose being to allow people to live more fulfilled, emotional and physically healthier uh, lives. And that then develops that sense of identity and community and so forth that, that we see in places that work well, remembering that places are ego systems as well as ecosystems or entanglements of people. Um, so just a, a few ideas from the, from the book. Um, I think Alan's points about urbanisation are really well made. And there's a different way of looking at those figures about half the world in a city, thinking about it from the perspective of evolutionary psychology. <clears throat> and we can turn it on its head and we can say that despite cities dominating our, our present way of life, cities have only been around for about eight, maybe 10,000 years, modern humans for 200,000 years. 
So of the estimated 107 billion people that have ever lived, hardly any of us have ever visited, never mind lived in uh, a city, if we put it into that context. And uh, we're very adaptable, very adaptable species, but I think even our gifts have limits and it's worth questioning how well adapted we are to uh, urban living. And some of the evidence we've seen suggests that. And urbanisation in evolutionary terms has happened in the blink of an eye, really. Um, as Jan Gale put it, we know more about what it takes for, to make a good habitat for mountain gorillas than we do about how to live well uh, in our own cities. Um, and that doesn't in any sense mean that cities are bad. On the contrary, they're the solution, uh, not the problem. And we should also note that cities are really good for building personal resilience. They ask us, they demand of us uh, to, that we deal with clamour, diversity and difference li living in proximity. Um, but there are elements of our psychological past that we bring into the present, just in the same way that the body is the museum of human physical ev evolution. Our mind is a kind of psychological museum of our psychological past and thinking more about that can find us different ways to thrive in the urban environment. I think biophilia is absolutely one of those and I was just struck when listening to Alan's arguments um, thinking about the work of a, an American urbanist and psychologist, the late uh, James Hillman who talked about this and he said you know, don't divide nature and the city, the city comes from us we come from nature and actually the division that we've created in that dialogue doesn't help us to think about how we can uh, bring both together in a way which allows us to, to live in a more easeful sense. The way in which we experience time in cities, the demands on our attention, all of these are very, things are very, very different to the historic way that we confronted those things. So I think it's absolutely astonishing that psychology, which is the discipline that seeks to deal with all these issues, with notable exceptions, is almost absent in urban policy and thinking. We need to bring it much more front and centre, and that's really why we embarked on the book. The book doesn't set out a kind of final position. It asks more questions than it answers, but it, we hope it does create a platform um, for debate. And we work with 11 cities internationally to do this, uh, with Ghent, Antwerp, Berlin, Lisbon, Adelaide, uh, Minneapolis, Milton Keynes, Krakow, Bilbao, Oslo uh, and Plymouth and trialled some of the ideas with them. I think there is a, a basic point about understanding our fundamental drives and innate emotional needs and how those play out in the city. <clears throat> and just one example I'd raise is the, that of the, the peace psychologists, a group of social psychologists who work in disputed territories around the world, the Middle East, they worked in Northern Ireland, and <clears throat> they very quickly found that uh, when talking about uh, land and power, actually these weren't the things that really mattered <coughs> unless you understood the deep-rooted emotional needs in that place first. You could not get to a negotiation on those things. And those needs included a sense of belonging, uh, a right to feel secure, uh, self-esteem and respect, a right to cultural identity and to express it, the ability to participate in a sense of distributive justice and sometimes just an apology. How often do we bring that into our community engagement, our consultations and our planning exercises? How often do we simply ask people, how do you feel? How do you feel about this place, this project and what we're going to do? Um, Rhiannon's work uh, spoke to that very well. The London Mood Project is an app that asks people how they feel at different times of the day in different places around the city and builds a map of the emotion uh, of that place. So it's almost like, in a sense, reversing the traditional planning perspective of top-down at a map, looking at the city from bottom up through an emotional lens uh, of feeling. Um, the third one is just going with this innate ability we have to anthropomorphise uh, the world around us, if not an innate ability to pronounce that word, which I find, I find really challenging. But you know, projecting human emotions onto our dogs, naming our cars, all these things. You know, we see the world through a human 
uh, emotional lens and we speak of cities as sober, romantic, can-do, edgy, stifling, welcoming. And those are all personality traits, actually. <clears throat> so we're humanising cities and we thought about this and thought, well, what would happen if a city took a personality test? Would it be uh, introvert or extrovert? Would it be agreeable or disagreeable? Uh, so we wrote one and we trialled it. Um, and it's a, it's a reasonably uh, complex piece of work. It is online, and here's the, here's the address. And it's free to use at the moment. You can log on and just use this. Your city is probably on there. We've got a list of about 200 cities. Um, and the address is in the, in the book with more detail about this. Um, and we've trialled this. It's, it's an automated test, you know. It's only going to be so um, detailed. And what we're not saying is that this represents the truth of your city in any sense uh, and personality of, of a city is a very very complex thing it's a multi-layered set of identities we're not saying it can be reduced in that way at all that would be completely foolish what we are saying is that this reveals something about your perception of that city and is a different way into a conversation about that place and we've used this in workshops uh, with the cities that some of the cities are indicated. And the results were absolutely amazing. We had people in those workshops who knew nothing about uh, how the city worked, the project, who frankly had no interest in it either, um, certainly not specialists, who could then speak about that as if it were a person. You know, what is our sense of confidence? Do we sweep things under the carpet? Do we trust? You know, all those sort of personal things. And it just led into a different conversation about that place. And I think it's got potentially real applications at the level uh, of the neighbourhood um, uh, as well, for neighbourhood planning exercises. <clears throat> so finally, what sort of conclusions do, do we, did we draw from that? The first is that psychology is a really diverse set of disciplines that do not d agree with each other on even quite fundamental things. But taken as a piece, it's a really rich reservoir of thought and practice and evidence that's virtually untapped in the world of urban policy and thinking and indeed urban design. Although I think urban designers are probably at the front end uh, of, that, um, of that curve. So there's more that we can do. And in the book, we looked at each branch of psychology and what it might do. The second is that although cities in many ways strengthen our psychological resources because of the demands they make on us, um, actually there is a need to understand more about their impacts, their emotional and psychological impacts. That is simply a good thing to do and will help us to make and manage cities more effectively. Applying psychology to the city as a whole and not just to, put to people, transferring tools from person to place is a different way of getting into a conversation about the city and of intervening, actually, in what's taking place. And the city personality test is just one example we're working on, uh, on others. I think all of that requires a truly interdisciplinary approach, and this is where we ended up in the book. And it connects, this is where it connects to the core cities agenda, actually, which is all about aligning different um, interventions at a level uh, of place and so just can't resist it but we're actually launching the next wave of core cities policy next week on Tuesday in the House of Commons we have a green paper invest reform trust which will be on our website if you're interested in what we're doing on urban policy but sorry just move, move on from that so uh, it would be great to see some research research resource being put into this and when I think of interdisciplinary and when I think of design Immediately what pops into my head is the Bauhaus and, you know, absolutely tremendous vehicle for that. And perhaps in the same way that the Bauhaus thought about interdisciplinary work on the design of individual objects and buildings, perhaps what we need now is a kind of Bauhaus for place that extends beyond design and art and includes that, obviously, but into psychology, uh, ethnographers, uh, anthropologists, economists, uh, geographers and so on, sociologists, thinking about place in a much more rounded and holistic way. I don't know, it just struck me actually that 2019 is the 100 year anniversary of the founding of the Bauhaus in the Weimar uh, Republic. So why couldn't we do something like that here? 
in 2019, not a new institution, you know, maybe just an event, and, and hold an event in 2019 and think about what did the Bauhaus teach us about those, that interdisciplinary way of working and how can we bring that to bear on place and the challenges that we face now uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 21st century. So I think that as we continue to urbanise, those cities that are most able to understand and meet these fundamental psychological challenges alongside the necessities of creating quality jobs and quality places are, in my view, those that are likely uh, to most succeed. And therefore, I think this is a subject we need to take very seriously. Thank you.